John Porcelino is uh, a wonderful comic artist and he runs Spit and a Half, the, the distro, and he's been in uh, the documentary called Root Hog or Die, and just a wonderful guy, John Porcelino. Let me bring him on. Here he is. Hey, John. Hello. That's for John. <laughs> How you doing, buddy? And this is Big Boy. Hi, Big Boy. This is my, and I've got my lawyer with me, so he can pre-screen any kind of tough questions. <laughs> oh, man. I wish I had a really tough question now to ask. ask. That would have been the perfect timing to do that. He's what? purring. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what, how's Enough it? with the cats. Nobody likes cats, right? Oh, they no. Like I them. love cats. I'm a big, I know, big I know. fan I'm of the cats. Um, but uh, what, what's, how's business treating, treating you, man? Are you, are you weathering this storm? Uh, like, uh, in telling? a weird way, it's, I mean, it's been crazy busy. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, I That's mean, great. It's, it's weird to think about in those terms, but I uh, like with the distro, I think when the COVID stuff started and people realized they were going to be like sitting around, then I, uh, you know, my orders are pretty steady, but there was definitely a, a bigger influx of orders. And then uh, when people were stuck, you know, people were stuck at home and just sitting on their computers all day. So, you know, probably looking for some kind of distraction or whatever and, and stuff to read and everything. And then then I think there was a point where uh, people realized that this was going to be a big mess Hmm. In a lot, I mean, you know, economically and stuff like that. And I think oh, yeah. then things like just disappeared. And there was like a week or so where I didn't get any orders at all. And then I think at some point people were sitting around their houses worrying all the time. And they were just like, what the heck? <laughs> I have to. So um, got to do something for I've, entertainment, right? Yeah, yeah. And and I mean, I also, you know, I, I, I have a feeling there's so much stuff that's going around encouraging people if they have the means to support artists that they like their work and you know stuff like that and i sure. i feel like there's been a certain kind of uh influx of interest or things like that based on you know i think people are just trying to show support which i'm very grateful for you know and and with the distro it's it's i mean you know it's it's great for me because I'm I'm earning an income and stuff and paying bills, but it's also I'm getting cool comics out in the world and it's very satisfying and you know, so hopefully everybody wins and then people get cool stuff in the mail and the artists get paid and I pay my bills and everything rolls on a little bit further. And that's that's really what it's all about is just being able to survive, right? With them, you're right. There's so much support coming from everybody like come on let's not let this die do mm -hmm. you, do you, so i guess you you know you kind of answered one of my questions which was do you sort of see an opportunity in this uh you know tragic development where you you could become even more successful based on the fact that like you know diamond is is taking a break and and um People are looking for alternatives, you know, to get to get your comic fix. Not that not that the audience well, are exactly. Well, well, I mean, I would say, you know, like I think there definitely needs to be an alternative to Diamond, hmm. um, and maybe even seven or eight years ago, I would have, uh, you know, let's put it this way: when I I started. Spit and a half in '92, just with the idea that I wanted to have something that I, so I wouldn't have to go work in some crappy warehouse or something like that to earn a living, you know. Right. And um, I, I, my only goal really was that it could tr oh, uh, kind of allowed me to focus on my own work, my own comics a little bit more, and like, you know, pay my printing bills and stuff like that. And at the time, it was so cheap to live you know i moved to denver in 92 and my rent was 175 dollars a month so it was like yeah. you know i don't think you can get a parking space for that anymore. no no and so and so i could afford to i could i i it was kind of an experiment in frugality you know of just like what's the bare minimum i can get by with and i i started the distro with that in mind like can i make 175 dollars a month selling yeah. comics through the mail you know and it it 
it kind of gradually grew and there were there was a period where I had to stop uh, for about 10 years just because of I, I had some serious health issues and I just right. couldn't keep up the, the energy requirement. Um, and I restarted the distro in about 2010, 2009, 2010, and kind of it slowly grew. And of course, at this point with the Internet and stuff, it's a lot easier to grow that kind of thing. So um, there was a point probably about eight years ago where I really wanted to turn this into a so-called legitimate business. I wanted to ha have a warehouse space. I wanted to be able to hire a couple employees and stuff like that and really uh -huh. push it as, as a viable alternative distributor for the comics world. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's such a tough thing. I, I having no capital and like basically living month to month, I just, I didn't see any way to really push it that hard I, I i mean i feel like the time was right and i do think that there's a place in comics distribution for a st strictly alt comics distributor yeah. you know diamond can diamond can keep the mainstream stuff or whatever um the superhero stuff and they can do that and that's great but it doesn't you know clearly it doesn't really work for alt comics that system and uh i i really feel like there is an uh, opening, there's a need for a different distributor with a different kind of model. Right. And for a little while, I thought maybe it could be spit and a half. Um, but it was, uh, I don't have the money or the resources really to throw into something like that that's going to take a couple of years to develop into, you know, uh, 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 something in the black or whatever. And so, you know, I keep hoping. I, I talk to a lot of people. Every once in a while, I'll come across someone. And I'll think, oh, maybe this is a, somebody who could like pull that off. And I think it would be great. But um, so you know, it's it's funny because the whole diamond thing, the stores that are reliant on diamond, um, is sadly, there. I feel like at this point, there's unfortunately not too much overlap. It seems like there's stores that are. Uh, the stores that are so reliant on Diamond that they're going to collapse without Diamond, there's just, unfortunately, there's not a lot of overlap with the kind of stuff that I carry, you know? Yeah. And then there's other stores that, like, you know, I talk about this all the time, the kind of classic vision, the golden age direct market comic book store that had had DC and Marvel and, I, at this point, Image and all the independent you know, genre and superhero comics, but also had comics for kids and also had alternative comics and literary comics and art comics and a uh, good selection of back issues and and uh, was focused on the breadth of the comics world rather than this little niche, superhero niche. Right. You know, um, I wish there were more shops like that, you know. And so when I work with shops, it seems like those are the... Uh, it's either those kind of shops or the smaller the smaller zine shops or really like, you know, it's a place like Desert Island in Brooklyn or something. That's a really right. hyper focused, hyper curated kind of art comics right. hub. I, um, I think New York's got a lot of great, great stores. Uh, but uh, um, also in uh, in Seattle, there's some great stores. I mean, actually, there's like one or two in Denver that uh, I really really like i really love kilgore uh, yeah sure and mutiny information cafe you know i'm on a i'm on a facebook group that is uh probably you're on too which is a bunch of people in the comics world it's mostly plan c super su plan c yeah, yeah mostly superhero focused because that's what most of uh, comics retail is, yeah. but, um, you know, and I don't mean this as a dig on anybody involved. It's just, man, there's, it's, uh, the stores are, are getting pounded. I mean, they're, you know, what, what are like 85% of them have had to close their doors, right. you know, and, Temporary. and, uh, you know, I, I, I feel a little bit bad for them because then there's, there's, uh, a lot of, creators and, and publishers small publishers on there that are you know like well i'll I, let me get you my comics and do the you know and i understand it's it's like 
it's gross to say opportunity, but it's also oh, like yeah. I don't I don't know that these stores are in any position to be taking on a bunch of like, you know, stock that they don't know that they're going to be able to sell and they don't know how they're going to pay for and stuff. You know, it's, it's just a messed up situation and everybody's kind of freaking out, you know, and I, I, I totally understand it. It's just, I I don't know how this is going to all shake out for comics. Yeah. uh, I mean, I, I think uh, in terms of the the mainstream stuff, it's probably due to be blown up a little bit um, because things are so, uh, what's the word sort of dug in on us in it like you said the the superhero stuff and it, it's just um i you were talking uh to noah the other day i, I watched that and you were you mentioned uh, about being a niche of a niche and mm-hmm. that, that's some that's a, com- a comment that i've made about the kind of comics that we're doing mm-hmm. um but it doesn't it shouldn't really be that way you know? No, absolutely not. I mean, the truth that I'm a niche of a niche, but in truth, my my like my comics have a huge wide audience. Right. That I mean, and because I'm a self publisher, I'm privy to all this information. I see where the orders are coming in and going out, and who's buying them, and who's talking about them and stuff. I mean, King Cat is read by 14 year old teenage girls. Yeah, in the Cleveland suburbs, and it's read by seventy-five-year-old grandmas in Tucson. You know what I mean? Like right. my my works has that ability to span generations and all kinds of demographic lines and stuff like that. But you know, I also understand it's it's I I, I do things in a certain way that is is not necessarily commercial, and it, being commercial isn't my focus and. You know, if you're not every, frankly, probably most stores in this country, most comic shops are not set up to deal with that kind of thing. And one of my things that's really painful to me about the comic book store situation is like I talked about with Noah, I grew up right when the direct market was starting and stuff. So I remember those, like I call them, those, the golden age of the direct market when you had these comic shops that were really for for all kinds of people anybody could walk in and find something of interest to them right and um the way it's gone where the average comic shop has become begun to focus more and more each succeeding generation focuses more and more and more hyper laser on this superhero world is that um they've those stores that have done that have lost generations of readers. They've lost generations of comics readers who love comics and are passionate about comics and and who have learned or were born into a world even where your local comic book shop is just not the place that they g- can go to get the kind of comics they like. It's not even an option anymore, right. you know? And so like the stores have lost all those those potential customers. And as creators and publishers, we've lost that retail infrastructure mm-hmm. that would be great to be able to connect with. And the readers have lost the ability to go into their local comic shop and find that kind of wide breadth of material that al- allows them to hook into comics you know and 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 you know god bless superheroes you know but it's like not to the exclusion of all else well yeah so like when you're 12 years old or 14 years old and reading superhero comics and then you grow up a little bit so like i'm lucky because when i was going into comic shops I kind of was always into the more weird stuff. There was a period of maybe a, a year or so where I was into Marvel comics and stuff. And and I had a breaking point with it at some point. I got the newest Fantastic Four and it was this long, like, five-issue arc. And it all, you know, like, what are we going to do? The world's going to blow up. And Reed Richards just, like, in the, on the last two pages, he creates, like, some machine and, like, presses the button and it solves this problem. And I was just like, you know what? 
I'm, they've just got me hooked in the way my mom is hooked into soap operas, you know, where like I, I have to find out what the next one is. And I've invested so much in it. I've got to. And this was only after a year of reading that stuff. But luckily, you know, I was going to Moondogs comics in the Chicago suburbs and and right next to Fantastic Four number whatever it was, 300 and whatever. Yeah. Was Love and Rockets number two or or neat, neat stuff, or, you know, and this was all the black and white glut. So there was all kinds of like weird, weirder comics, more idiosyncratic things okay. that didn't have anything to do with superheroes or like, you know, a 40 year story arc or anything like that. That was that all of a sudden started to resonate with me more. So I was able to just like, oh, I stopped reading Marvel comics and the next new comics day. I still went to Moondogs. I just didn't buy any Marvel comics. They had a ton of other stuff for me to check out and explore, you know, and, and those days are gone. And it's it's yeah. just it's a shame for everybody involved. It would have been so much better for this whole scene, everybody, retailers, readers, creators, publishers, whatever, if there if we had been able to maintain that kind of uh, open open minded or open ended view of what a comic shop is do you see that uh sort of model you know being more successful in uh in europe today or in japan or something where they have a lot more variety of stuff or is it, you could find it to be the same in, like, well, i i you know i i can't really speak to i can't speak to those situations except of what you hear over here you know you know like to me i once i was into comics it was like you think about france or something and it's like a this you know pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for cartoonists but then i talk to my friends who are my french friends who are making weird comics and they're just like well you know it's probably better than the u.s but it's it's not any great shakes over here too much either you know people the the vast majority of stuff that's that's being put out is is still you know dumbed down right fad fad chasing stuff i was looking at re-looking at, at uh, that movie uh American Splendor, and I, I read all of those, you know, back when I was in college, and uh, I see a, maybe there's a connection between you and what he does. Were you influenced by Harvey at all? Uh, it's, well, the, the funny story about that is that uh, when I started making King Cat, I think I was, a, I was aware of American Splendor because I'd see it on the rack at Moondogs or Keith's Comics or whatever where I, I used to go. Uh, Kevin's Book Exchange, yeah. And uh, um, and when I started doing King Cat, a lot of comics people were like, you got to check out Harvey Pekar. And so I specifically did not read American Center for a long time. Because you wanted to. Because I didn't want it to, like, somehow in my head, I mean, I was 20 years old or whatever. I, right. I didn't want it to taint what I was doing. You know, it, I didn't want to. But, you know, pe people told me all the time, like, oh, you need to check this out. And it, it, uh, it wasn't till, I guess, 90. Well, it was when I, I had my surgery, so 97. Oh. And after uh, I had a big life-saving surgery and I came home and on the way home from the hospital in Denver we stopped at all in a dream on Colfax and I bought a huge stack of graphic novels and comics and stuff like a foot and a half high you know nice. and it, w another way you can tell that times have changed is I bought a foot and a half stack of graphic novels and comics and, and I remember it was $77 or $78 was my total you know and yeah. I, I there's probably 30 books or something. Wow. And uh, and I read uh, one of the books I got was Our Cancer Year, which was uh, I write about it in my book, The Hospital Suite. But there's a there's a scene. So in in my case, I got so sick that I, I lost about 35 pounds in a couple of weeks, in a month or so. And so my at one point I was in the bathroom and my wedding room just rolled off my finger because my finger was half as wide as it had been wow. a month earlier or whatever. And I was like, I'm going to have to put this in my comic when uh, I do the comic about this hospital experience. And then I sat down on the couch with uh, that stack of stuff and I got there's a, the exact same scene in in our cancer year where Harvey's in the kitchen and he gets up and his uh -oh. ring rolls off his finger and rolls under the counter and I was yeah. like damn it Picar uh, yeah yeah 
Yeah, but but, but, I, but I would but say then right away I knew well it'll be funnier now because I'll be able to put the scene in about oh, Harvey sure. Kirk snaking me. <laughs> I mean, I kind of learned early on with my autobiographical autobiographical comics to um, that there was kind of a certain power and. Um, resonance that you could get by leaving things unsaid or leaving things a little bit open-ended you know yeah um and uh um you know sometimes i'll do stories that are, you, they kind of neatly tie up in a in a bow or whatever you know or kind of have a have a beginning a middle and an end but uh you know early on i got a real kick out of um out of making comics where you it would start kind of in the middle of the story there'd be like this little episode of life and then would just kind of abruptly end without any kind of resolution or clarity about things um they're like little pieces of a puzzle that the reader gets and can figure out where this goes in and you plunk it in here and then all of a sudden you've got a little bit of a bigger picture you know and so like Cre creatively or artistically, um, I wanted to write about life. I wanted to write about my real life experiences and feelings and stuff. Um, and I was aware pretty early on that life, you know, maybe when you're 85 on your deathbed and you look back, you can see this kind of grand narrative arc that trans, trans, tra uh, trans, what's the word? Transform, transpired transpired yeah through the course of your life uh but when you're in it it's these little these little moments right. and on their own they're very interesting uh and they can be very powerful or very mysterious and then but then the the did the more they build up and and connect and the pieces you know uh, attached to each other, it creates that bigger picture. It sounds like you're, One of my you're describing a mosaic. Sure. So, yeah, some some good, good uh, artistic word like that. You know, my <laughs> my friend John Rinninger, one of my favorite things he said to me, he said was, "The older I get, the the deeper the chord, the richer. I'm sorry, the richer the chord of my life gets. The oh, chord wonderful. meaning like a musical chord, like a a series of notes that resonate with each other and play off each other and kind of grow into something that you can't get from an individual musical note. But you get this, you know. He's talking about some kind of really. The older he gets, the more the richer that chord gets. Everything is resonating with everything else. Everything's connected to everything else. Everything is bouncing off everything else. And, uh, you know, so that's kind of the way I think about my comics is they're, they're little pieces of this big thing. And it all comes together, uh, even when it doesn't seem like it's coming together at some point, hope it, it, it will. Right. You know, oh, uh, where can people get where would you prefer people get your King Cat at Spit and a Half or at JohnPorcelino.com or? Well, I've moved. Yeah. So uh, ordering uh, King Cat online is all done through spitandahalf.com now. OK. And uh, everything that everything that I have in print is up there and available for purchase. Um, you know, on the off off chance that you have some local shop that that carries it. I, I, think, I think there's I've probably everything I've ever bought of yours. I've gotten at Kilgore. Yeah. Well, that's Kilgore's a good one or Quimby's or Desert Quimby's Island or. You know, oh, there's yeah. there's those little shops around the country that have a more a focus on that kind of stuff that, you know, you could always try. I know like, you know, some of the place like Copacetic in Pittsburgh, I've been filling orders with him. He's still doing tons of mail order and mm -hmm. and Quimby's in Chicago. They have somebody there doing mail order all day long, even though the doors are locked, you know, so, um you know, I'd love for people, if you want to order it from me, that's fine. But if you can find it somewhere else, I'm happy to share the love yeah. with some of these other uh, retailers. It's a tough it's a tough question. On the one hand, I, I, I love to support the artists directly because then, you know, there's less of a, a middleman. But on the other hand, you know, I love I love my local shops, you know, and they're they do so much to, you know, get the sure. 
to get the word out about them. It's a tough one for me, you know. Yeah, you know, as well, as I'm, publisher, I'm, I, I try not to sweat that stuff too much. I'm just happy if somebody picks up a King Cat and and is moved by it or gets something out of it. it doesn't really matter to me too much where they got it. But uh, you have a you know. strong little fan base. I, you know, everybody I've ever talked to that has heard of you just absolutely loves loves King <laughs> Cat. And I don't know, can you? I mean, I guess you've been telling us uh, for the past twenty minutes or whatever about why that is. But do, do you have? I mean, certainly, you know, you do something over and over, and you get really good at it. And I think the subtlety and sort of uh, the experiential quality of it for me you can compare the stuff you've done in the last 10 years to the stuff before that. And I think it's just, there's no comparison. You know, the work is so much more elegant now. And, uh, I mean, you started off as kind of a punk artist. Sure. Uh, yeah. I, this is like the highest praise I can give a, a, a comic book artist is that you have a great sense of design. Thanks. Uh, I brought some of my favorites, uh, like, uh, I don't know if you guys know this one, Mosquito Abatement Man. This one's actually got some stuff from, from longer ago. But uh, I think the little things that you added to it really, really heighten it, you know. Yeah, well, that one, that one because it is it is a span of a right. long period of time, um, the comics were drawn over a long time. You really see the way it kind of evolved through things, through the years. Um, but... Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, am I, I am super grateful that I have the readership that I do. And and um, I think in, in some ways it's a matter of just being persistent and consistent. You know, like I I decided to, well, I was 20 years old when I published the first issue and I decided very early on that this was what I wanted to do with my life. This was the way I wanted to make art. This was the format I wanted to put it in. Um, this is how I wanted to get it out in the world. And so I, I feel a little bit lucky that I kind of had that uh, vision come to me pretty early on. So I've been able to kind of stay connected to that thing over the years. Um, and so, you know, I and, uh, you know, it's funny when I my whole thing with being an artist and part of the, the reason that I gravitate to comics versus painting or other other art forms was that uh, especially self-publishing comics like zines in the zine world was that um, there's a real give and take between the the author and the reader you know and so um, and then when you talk about punk that's one of the things I always bring up and I came out of the punk world and in in punk that line between the performer and the audience is very very thin and it's co it's constantly being crossed over right you know and um so i wanted to share my experience of life and my experience in the world with other people but i wanted to do it in a way that would be very accessible to people and that would encourage a relationship to develop you know, so like when I sent early days of King Cat in the zine world, you send out a zine and you get a letter in the mail back and the, somebody, the person will comment on the zine you sent them or they'll send you a copy of their zine and stuff and you write back and forth and you develop a sort of creative relationship with people. And that's what I wanted. I wanted to communicate with people and I wanted to connect with people through art and so I I just found that this this way, luckily somehow I stumbled on it of of making these these comics and sending them through the mail and and because of that I have a pretty unique relationship with a lot of my readers you know and I I talk about it all the time I mean I've been doing King Cat for thirty thirty one years so wow. You know, some of those 14-year-old punks in the Cleveland suburbs who picked up a King Cat years ago, they're, you know, what, they're in their mid-40s now. Right. You know what I mean? And so, in a way, I've grown up alongside my audience. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, it, for a lot of these people. You know, these people were 14-year-old kids and they grew up got out of high school, went to college, got married, 
had kids, whatever, they've got these, you know, and, and, and there's, and yet King Cat has been able to be this kind of like consistent thing in their life. And, and I, I think people appreciate that. And I know I do. And so to me, a big part of it is this kind of developing journey as I go through my life and everybody's there alongside me doing the same thing, you know, then my readership and, you know, of course, everybody in the whole world is doing this, but it's, it's really gratifying to have that kind of connection uh, with people because that's, that's really what I always wanted out of art was I just wanted to be able to connect with people so and, and in a two way street kind of way, you know, not just like, here I am, here's my new pronouncements, right. isn't that great? You know, in six months, I'll come back down from the mountain and give you another, you know, but I wanted to have a connection with people. You know, during those years when I was really sick, I kind of, I withdrew a lot and I was, I, I had to for health reasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I was consistently putting out King Cat, but I was kind of, oh I was kind of lived a pretty hermetic life. And uh, after I started to get better, and I started to travel again, uh, started working at D&Q and putting out book collections, and a new book would come out, and I'd go do a little signing tour. And when I started going back out, that's when it really drove home for me um, what it was all about, what, what my goals were with this, and that it really clarified that idea of I, I want to connect with people this is what I've wanted my whole life you know when I was a little kid I wanted to connect and I had creative ideas and I wanted to share them but I was so shy and and so antisocial and and so intimidated in social situations that I had to learn some way of communicating that you know kept me out of those, kept me from being so intimidated that I just didn't speak my mind at all. And then as I grew up and started getting a little bit better in social situations, you know, to go out on tour and have people come out, it was such a wonderful feeling. And to have people come up afterwards and sign books and, you know, people be like, you know, hey, I'm Joe Blow from, you know, from you know, Indianapolis. And I, you know, and I I remember them all. I can remember, you know, everybody. And and I'm like, wow, you know, they've been reading King Cat, writing to me for 10 years or ordering copies or whatever. And it really, having that experience of going out into back out in the world and actually encountering people face to face and having those conversations after a book signing or something, it was, it was like, oh yeah, this is, this is why I do it. And and it re- that really changed my um, connection with King Cat too, in a positive way. Because like a lot of cartoonists, it, c- cartooning is grueling, and uh, there's really no <laughs> no reason to do it, in, except that you just love doing it. Because there's no money in it, there's no prestige, <laughs> there's there's none of those things that kind of motivate people in the regular world to accomplish something right and what i found on those tours was this is what this is what motivates me is just is sharing things with people and having them share things with me and and connecting on that on that human level through artwork well on that note i want to um give you an opportunity to tell us like what so we had a question earlier uh which what th- what would you pick up first if if you had if, if you're not familiar with John Porcelino what would you recommend picking up first it's a tough question yeah uh, I mean Mosquito Bait and Bad is not bad because it does give you a range of stories over a course of time so you can see where and see where the comics started in the very early days and where they kind of developed in my more mature style and stuff like that and it's really it's cheap it's like twelve dollars and it's yeah it's, but it, you know but on the other hand that's it's all stories about this one particular job i had but i think that's a pretty good place to start 
I honestly sometimes I think just like the latest issue of King Cat is fine. What is unfortunately the- a bunch of unfortunately a bunch of my books are out of print now. They all went out of print last year at like the same time. But um, I think my favorite collection that I've done is Map of My Heart. Okay. Um, those those issues were. I mean, these you can find it the book used and stuff here and there. Um, uh, that was those stories were written through a really difficult time in my life. But I think maybe because of that, there's a kind of real clarity or focus to them. Um, and that's probably the work that I'm proudest of the stuff that's in map of my heart. Um, I'm going to have to pick that up. Is that, but that's a collection of the, 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 uh, the issues. Yeah, that collects like issues 51. So there's, there's been three King cat collections. There's King cat classics. That's issues one through 50. Uh Um, there is map of my heart came next and that covers issues 51 through 61. And then there's a book called from Lone Mountain, which is the one it's still in print. Okay. And that collects, uh, issues 52 to 60 or 62 to 68 or something like that. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to pick. So, yeah. And then there's a couple little standalone books that are more focused thematically or things like that. Um, pick those up from, from a half or are they out of print for you? Yeah, I've got, uh, I've got, I've probably got about the last couple copies left of, of those titles. Oh, save me that, um, my heart. Uh, <laughs> I'll save one for you. Thank you. I, I, yeah, I have to go to my storage unit. I think I've got a couple left. Hopefully they will be reprinted. I know DNQ has said that they want to reprint them, you know, given the state of the economy in the world right now, I, I would imagine that's low priority, but, um, Cool. You know, hopefully at some point, somehow they'll come back into print. But uh, and then I have, I think, the last seven or eight issues of King. The actual zines are still in print. And you can get those. Cool. But if you go to Spit and Half and search for John Porcelino, everything will come up. Well, I'll, I'll definitely do that. And I hope everybody <laughs> uh, else does that. We have a, qu- a quick question here, if I'm taking them. What is your favorite issue of a Kirby comic? If you don't have a specific issue, then how about a favorite run? I guess I'd say OMAC. Um, oh, wow. The 70s okay. series. Um, that was actually my first introduction to... I grew up reading Jack Kirby stuff because when I'd go to the comic book stores and dig through the quarter bins, uh-huh. I'd find the old 70s. There was like a bunch of comics from the early 70s like where monsters dwell monsters on the prowl and stuff right and i was really into monster movies and just monsters in general and stuff so i was really attracted to those and they were like a quarter so i had a those are actually the only like comic books that i nerdily collected where i like had an index (laughs) card in my pocket with like the list of the (laughs) issues i still needed so i could pull it out and refer to it when i was in a store um so those are my favorite those are my favorite comics of all time. Um, so OMAC is also, that's later period stuff for him. And so it's even more idiosyncratic and very, even more Kirby-esque, if you could call it that, I guess. And I just, I love every inch of that book. That is just crazy book. Cool. You know, OMAC. Can I, uh, can I try something out on you before we run out of time here? Uh, I decided yeah. I want to start asking, uh, finishing these these off with asking a really stupid question. I want to okay. try to answer, ask a like the dumbest question I can possibly think of. Uh, John Porcelino, with the popularity of Tiger King, has there been any runoff to King Cat, and has that affected you at all? <laughs> Are people like typing I, King Cat accidentally and, and getting you? If you type in King Cat now. You get a lot of non King Cat comics related things, uh, and I I get a lot of people who randomly post comment on my social media posts. Tiger King exclamation <laughs> mark stuff like that. I mean, one of the great things that has happened, and I have a little collection that's I I am adding to all the time is the like cheap Chinese T shirts that you can get at Walmart that are like pictures like super digitally photoshopped pictures of cats with crowns on Uh like with the like hip-hop holding like big wads of hundred dollar bills and stuff (laughs) and for some reason there's this whole like sub-genre of cheap t-shirts that are that are the the cat king like with a big cigar 
or like and they're always always tend to be holding out wads of cash and stuff like that. So I have I, I love those shirts. I, I think you got a case. <laughs> Could be. Yeah, yeah I've a lawyer who's right off references there. to King Cat. There's yeah. there's was a I don't know if it's still open in Seattle. There was a King Cat theater that like had bands play and. Uh, I think there's Cat King is is like a brand for like catfish lures, like oh, fishermen's wow. products. You can get Cat King stuff. Um, yeah, that kind of goes against what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So no, uh, you're not gonna be doing any. I'd love stuff. it too. I I do know that like when I'm at book festivals and things like that, a little bit more mainstream things, I do sell an awful lot of King Cat T-shirts to like little old ladies. Oh, sweet. We're just like, look, it's a cat on a T-shirt. How much is that? $15. <laughs> okay, I'll take two. So I do sell a lot of those. 